Model steam engines and boilers part 54, machining the eccentric strap using the steel bar for the eccentric sheave to make a mandrel. This series called How to Build a Model Steam Engine is for my Patreon supporters only. The full length versions of the episodes in the series contain a lot more information than you're about to see, but this is sufficient to give you a good idea how to do the job. Why is it a good idea to join Patreon? Firstly, you get to see the videos a few months before everyone else. You can download my ebook, The Essential Guide to Miniature Steam, which is completely free. And you can watch the entire series of How to Build a Model Steam Launch, which is over five hours of instructions. I would like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. I could not make these videos without your kind help and support. I started to make the eccentric strap in the previous episode. Now comes the hard part. I need to machine it so that it fits on an eccentric sheave, which I haven't made yet. Here's a piece of steel from which the eccentric sheave will be made, and I need to machine this to start with. The first part of the job involves lightly facing across the front. I don't want to remove too much metal. You will see why in the next episode. When I think about it, I really don't need to do this part of the job because the part of the eccentric sheave that I am machining will be machined away to nothing in the final operation in the next video. What I'm doing in this clip is turning this piece of steel down to just above the finished size that it needs to be, which is 1 and 1 16th of an inch in diameter. I did not turn it to the final size and I'll explain why later on in the video. Once I'd machined the part to slightly larger than 1 and 1 16th of an inch diameter, I removed it from the chuck. Here's a top tip for safely removing a chuck from a spindle that has a thread on the end. Before removing the chuck, bring the tailstock very close to it, open the jaws and wind the quill so it goes inside the jaws. In this clip the chuck is already loose, ready to come off the spindle, and this was the time I inserted the tailstock quill to stop the chuck from falling off onto the bed and trapping my fingers. Obviously I didn't tighten the jaws onto the tailstock quill. It was just there for some support if the chuck slipped. This is also a good tip. I'm using WD-40 to blast any metal particles away from the thread on the end of the spindle. Here I'm fitting my small four-jaw chuck. This is much easier to fit because it's hollow at the back, so you have sort of a handle you can get your fingers in. Here's a word of warning, don't do this. It's okay at this stage just to wind the chuck onto the spindle, but when it comes to tightening the chuck onto the spindle, do it like this. Open the jaws and use a piece of wood. You could use a metal bar I suppose, but I generally use a piece of mahogany. It's got a bit of spring in it. I put the lathe in back gear while I wound the chuck onto the spindle but now disengage the back gear so that the lathe will run at a higher speed. If you haven't done this before, you're in for some fun. Aligning a piece of metal to be machined using an independent four-jaw chuck is very difficult. It took me a while. I haven't shown all of the attempts at doing this, only the one when I finally got it right. Because don't forget, if you don't get this in the right position, when you machine it, it will be scrapped. Often I will say, you don't need to do this and you don't need to do that because this is not a precision part, but that rule does not apply here. This is a precision part and must be treated as such in every step of the operation. The very end part of the eccentric sheave that are partially machined is turned to 1 and 1 16th of an inch, so I can use it as a bit of a plug gauge, but the rest of it is slightly larger. Even though I've made quite a lot of these sort of things over the years, I still find it a very nerve-wracking procedure. There are just so many potential fails. Had I have ground too much material away from the outside, then the part would be too thin and too weak. If the hole that I'm boring isn't in the right place, then it's going to be a mess as well. So I will repeatedly say that when you're working with four-jaw independent chucks, take your time get it right. If at first you don't succeed, throwing yourself off a high public building is not the answer. Just put the job down for a while, have a cup of tea and start again.
If you take a close look at the eccentric strap as it is at the moment, you will see that the bottom half of it is a bit thicker than the top bit. Well, that's OK, because I haven't finished cleaning that up. The main thing is, the hole that I've bored in it is now the right size, and it's in the correct position. After one more very fine finishing cut, that was it. I removed the eccentric sheave, and now I'm removing the chuck, because I need to go back to my three-jaw chuck for the rest of the operation. And before dismantling the eccentric strap, I'm making a centre punch mark in the bottom of it. And when I disassemble and reassemble the part, I know which bit goes where. Here you see the principle, and don't forget this is the underside view. It's time now to separate the two parts of the eccentric strap. And to heat up the part in order to melt the solder, I'm using my small Proxon blowtorch. I would like to take this opportunity to mention that I am not making this part the same as shown on the drawing. Normally, an eccentric strap for a Stuart Victoria has a groove machined around the inside. On smaller Stuart engines, the groove is machined on the eccentric sheave, but I don't want any grooves on the sheave or the strap. I want maximum bearing surface. This, of course, means that my eccentric sheave will be made differently. More about that in the next episode. I make eccentrics for model steam engines the way I would make them for a miniature locomotive, either for the valve gear, if it's Stevenson's link internal, or for the eccentric that is used to drive the axle pump. Now is the time to machine the eccentric sheave part of the way down to exactly 1 and 1 16th of an inch. I'm now using the embryo eccentric sheave as a mandrel on which to turn the eccentric strap to the correct thickness. And once again, I am modifying the design. On the drawing, this eccentric strap is shown to be a quarter of an inch thick. I'm making it 5 sixteenths of an inch thick. For the simple reason, the more bearing surface, the better the thing will be. Now it's time to start the clean-up operation. All I'm doing at the moment is deburring. So using the sandpaper on the bench is perfectly fine. I've really zoomed in in this clip so you can see that the part is quite well made. There's still a bit of cleaning and polishing to do, but it's looking good as it is. And don't forget something that I say frequently in these videos. Each and every part of the engine is a model in itself. And that concludes this episode all about making the eccentric strap. Next I will make an eccentric sheave to match it. That will be in the next episode. Until then, stay safe, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.